here. Okay, great. Um, so, um, yeah, as you'll know, we're absolutely delighted to be joined by Baroness Gowdy, who is a member of the House of Lords and has had an incredible career um, from a sort of councillor in her mid-twenties um, in Brent to now sort of in the House of Lords and um, working on some really interesting sort of international issues. Um, the sort of thread, I think, throughout the whole of her career has been looking at issues to do with inequality and particularly um, feminist issues um, around advancing um, the role of you know women in society and creating um, more opportunities um, if anyone throughout the conversation if anyone's got any questions if you put just put them in the chat box and then um, when we finish sort of having an initial conversation I'll, I'll meet you and you can ask your questions uh, directly so yeah so we're going to begin um, by firstly saying thank you for joining us um, and I was wondering if you can start off by just talking a little bit about how you got into politics and what it was like um, being a councillor in Brent at the sort of beginning of your political career. Thank you. I, I, I won't speak too long on all the issues because I really enjoy questions and you get much more out of me and also you'll know what you want to know. Um, I was started to get interested in politics, um, partly in the sixth form at school, because some families um, who came to my school were part of the first Windrush family and came to help to build the buses as there was a big bus factory in Southall. And there were some prejudice then because we had about eight or nine girls and some boys um, came to the school, although we already had immigrant families, but they were second and third generation. Um, and I, of course, was the first generation of an Irish family. Um, so, you know, I got upset, not in school, but got upset when I got home and discussed it at home. And, you know, we helped to, to, to understand what the situation was. And also Irish families at that time had some prejudice against us. And that's why we were sent to learn elocution lessons on the one hand, but Irish dancing and going to church and everything else on the other hand, you know, and going to Ireland. So then um, when I was 16, I joined the Young Socialists because I felt this was somewhere that I could work with others of like mind to make some changes. I wasn't sure at that time what the change would be, but it was about what, what would happen. Um, at that time, they were trying to, for Harold Wilson to become Prime Minister, people were working. It was a great joy when Harold Wilson came to do a meeting, which seemed a long time ago, but those were the sort of heroes and others that were around. And I went to a Labour Party conference and listened to a speech on, on the white light and the white the future. So from the Young Fabians, I joined the Young Fabians and other groups while doing all of this. And then I stood for the council when I was just 21 in a marginal seat um, in the borough of Wembley and Wilsdon, which had just become Brent, because at that time it was decided to reorganise London um, and Wilsdon and Wembley, which was not a very easy marriage because you had a very working class area with bad housing, bad education, people living a room, a house with a gas cooker on the floor, to the suburbanness of Wembley, Sudbury Hill and Harrow, Kenton, where people were living in family houses. Um, and I stood in a ward that was half and half. It was Tokington. We, we did very well, but it was at the time when Labour lost all councils. It was a bad period for Labour. Then four years later, I was selected and supported, which I didn't know at the time when I went to the selection meeting, by the post office union in Wilsdon. Um, I knew some of the members quite well and had done some work for them while they had one of their mini strikes. Um, and they selected me for the Roundwood Ward, which was a very interesting, and no university career could give you, or course could give you what I learned in Roundwood in eight years. It had the highest cot deaths at that time. It had a huge amount of people living, as I say, families living one room, sharing, sharing cookers, living in damp, learnt about how mice gives children asthma, outside toilets in some cases, rapmanism was going on, in Notting Hill, Kensington, and Ladbroke Grove. And we verged onto that. Also in my ward was the factory of Brunwick. So we have the huge Brunwick 
dispute, which was on the edge of my ward. Um, and also some of the people who were in my ward were there, the post office union were affected in that. So the whole Grunwick issue was huge. Plus at the same time, housing and education were huge. Um, and we were able to work over eight years to see terrible housing pulled down and new housing built. The new housing that we thought was the right housing, which was council flats. And we were taught, taught that as part of those high rise flats and those not only in my ward, but in the whole of Brent would have some greenery around those. That didn't quite happen, but we did the right thing. And it was what we thought was the right thing at that time. And families did have a better place to live. There was more choice in schooling. Some of the schools were changed. Families moved around. At the same time, we were able to bring in some industry to, to, to Wilsdon, uh, which there wasn't then. Because the other, other issue we had was high unemployment. So I learned very early on that if you're going to try and alter unemployment, you have to work hard with other boroughs to bring industry. And Park Royal, joint with Ealing, was industry then, but it needed to change because it was heavy industry and stuff was changing again. So I learned all about development, both planning side and also the development of bringing industry in to, to Brent. And about cot deaths, uh, about families not going to school, about families not going to work, about girls having babies, because that was something to love. So all the syndromes that we know today and about child rights, because even at that point, people were marrying their daughters off because they thought it was an easy way to sort situations out, which we know today was not. Um, and then at the end of the eight years, we moved to Camden. Uh, that was a family decision to move to Camden. Um, and we moved to Camden and I helped to set up a housing association in Brent, which still exists, but amalgamated with other Brent People's Housing Association. And while I was in Brent, I was very active in the Fabian Society there. And while I was there, I um, was uh, made contact with Dennis Healy, who I knew a little, and through Diane Hayter and other colleagues. Um, I assisted um, with, with Roy Hattersley and Peter Shaw, which is in the history books. So I won't bore you with it all, but the history of the Labour Solidarity Campaign. And I helped set that up and run that. We made it look much bigger than it really was. But you can do a lot with publicity. Um, and through that, we helped to make change and to get eventually, after a couple of bad elections, um, a Labour government. Uh, Roy, as you knew, stood with Neil Kinnock for the dream ticket. We did quite well to lead the Labour Party, but we didn't quite make it to lead the country. Um, and then John Smith uh, unfortunately died, but John was elected. And then of course, Tony Blair came the leader and with, Roy ha with, with, with um, Gordon, with Donald Dewar, with Helen Liddell, we got the cabinet that we all know about. And we won Scotland. I mean, it was amazing that we got between 50 and 60 seats in Scotland and we used to say, just give us 40 or 50, we could get control, you know. So there was that landslide and I worked on policy and I worked with many other people. I was very privileged. As I say, nobody could have taught me what I learned and you learned it on the hoof. And then I was invited um, by uh, Paris de Blair to go to the House of Lords in 1997 and I went in 1998. Alongside of that, I had day jobs and I was learning about the international world out there, working with WWF, where I was working in Brussels um, and here, learning about um, the G7, the G20, how to influence them. The Bank of European Reconstruction was just started then. The Cohesion Fund was up and running. So these were really new groundbreaking things that were happening there. But I was lucky enough to learn about them. All of those put me in good stead for what I'm doing now. Um, and also I started to learn how you could use these if you knew how to work the system. Getting others to work the system, of course, none of these things do you do alone. And um, because my parents were Irish, I was very concerned about Ireland, we were going back and forth. And then I started doing some work with the women in Northern Ireland, 
the Northern Ireland Community Foundation, which was the organization that um, ran the women candidates in the end, um, Monica Wood Williams and Jane Smith, um, and set up uh, the first time that women were at the peace talks. They sat outside the peace talks that Easter and were not prepared to leave. Um, they've sat there in rotors and um, Tony and um, Mo Moland and others knew these women and they knew the right thing was to invite them in. And that story again is in the history books, but I was privileged to work with them. And Alphala did, Kilmurray, who's well known in Northern Ireland, did all the writing of the manifestos and so on. And then I continued to work with them, um, going over constantly. And during that period, um, I met somebody who's a, become a very, very close friend who I work with every day in different ways, is Ambassador Milan Vivir, who was the head of Hillary Clinton's office in the White House. And through Milan and Hillary, I became involved in Vital Voices. I knew about the Beijing conference, but by the time I learned about it, we'd already got good delegates going, so it was a bit late. But from Beijing, it gave the agenda that we work on today. Because whatever way, we've got all these great people working, but it is the Beijing agenda that we work to for women and girls. Um, and I won't go down other things, but I will just say to you that through meeting somebody called Winchy, you Perkins, who again, I speak to constantly in 1998 with Northern Ireland and Vital Voices, I learned about human trafficking. Mm -hmm. And Winchy invited me naively, to, from my point of view, to a meeting at the UN. And I was told that Britain hadn't ratified the Convention on Human Trafficking. I asked a friend of mine in my office in the House Floors, John Tomlinson, and he said to me, there's a bigger one and a better one, the European Convention on Human Trafficking. And I was able to persuade, took a lot of persuasion over a couple of years with the help of Jeff Hoon and other ministers to get that ratified. And it was difficult. And that's when I learned that the cabinet office is the machinery of government because if you could get something to the cabinet office, they could bring in the other people. And it was the home office that was being, as ever, was being difficult then, over their dead body, etc. We got it ratified. We then got the bill brought forward um, through Prime Minister May when she was at the home office. One of the great things she did, not too much, but one of the great things she did was getting this bill to parliament because the human trafficking bill and got it again again, that ratified because we then got the whole situation of the supply chain, which companies have to sign up to, prosecutions, still a long way to go, but the machinery of government is there to make that happen and prosecutions can be done. And a lot of my colleagues are working on these issues now, which is absolutely great. And then the other big issue that I was privileged globally, although I'm doing other things, was uh, through um, William Haig and Hillary Clinton at the UN, well, William Haig was foreign secretary, um, who's got the, the whole um, concordia done for sexual violence and conflict. And as you know, we've been able to have um, in the House of Lords an all party group with the Commons. We've had a, 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 a House of Lords select committee into sexual violence and conflict. We've been able to get our Ministry of Defence to do training. There's a whole, you could ask me all sorts of questions about that, but that was huge. And I have to say that last night I had the pleasure of listening to Lisa Nandy at the Parliamentary Labour Party, um, where she set out the agenda for, for, for uh, foreign affairs. And she said, great sh sadness is that William Hague was the last best foreign secretary we've had. And that's some time, you know, seems only yesterday, but some time ago. And it was true. Some of the groundbreaking work he did Made, made certain things happen. And at the same, just to say that, at the same time um, as uh, this legislation was going through the UN and other governments, um, Ambassador Mavir um, had been the ambassador, first global ambassador for women appointed by President Obama. And she had just stepped down after four years and she and Hillary Clinton decided they would set up at Georgetown the um, Institute for Women, Peace and Security, um, which I'm on the board of. And it's thriving, it's under the foreign school and it's an institute within the foreign school. And a year later, or two years later from after it being set up, uh, William Haig approached me with others 
in New York, in Washington, and said, we have to do this in the UK. And with his support and with Chloe Dalton and Ambassador Hel Helic, who was not ambassador, but she, um, uh, sorry, a member of the House of Lords, we set up the Institute for Women, Peace and Security at the LSE. And these two organizations are working daily to train and to write papers on why we need to have women at the peace table and why the peace is held um, and training. And there's also degree courses, post degree courses and so on and are taught. Um, and they, they, they are the first of their kind. And then of course, in, in the House of Lords, I work on women and girls issues, um, on men and women working together. And I'll stop in a minute, but one other thing that I very, feel very strongly about is women on boards. And just under 10 years ago, myself and Helena Morrissey sat down and decided that we wanted to do something to get more women on boards, but not just at the top, but to ensure that the pipeline was taken care of. And uh, so we set up the 30% Club, the web page is there, um, and we've got chapters, international chapters. It's a campaign, not an NGO, because we hope one day we won't need to be there. We help Roger Preston to launch Speakers for Schools, and that is a huge organization ensuring that people from business, from politics, and other parts of the UK speak at schools because children have got to understand that every door is open to them. And Speakers for Schools is so important. But 30% Club you can look at their website and see where we're going from there. But that really makes a difference. That was where we were able to put pressure on the government. We had a blip this year, so we're causing, I've put a number of questions down about how many women are on boards, um, setting up Hampton Alexander uh, Committee, which, which is a, set up before by Gordon Brown and David Cameron, set it up with Mervyn Davis. He did it for X years. And then um, Hampton, Philip Hampton is taking that forward. So there is pressure on companies, not only to have 30 to 50% women on boards, but it's also about now the gender pay gap and the reporting, not just on the FTSE 100, but on the 350. And had a meeting today with the Investors Association, who, which represents pension, the biggest pensions to the smallest investors, putting pressure on their members that this is the right thing to do. And it really can only be done by men and women working together. The history of these organizations is all on the web, so it's easy to find it out. But I'd really like to open everything up to discussion uh, and so on. And to say that the House of Lords is really working well, like the Commons just now, virtually trying to hold this government to account, who does not want this to happen at all. And the leader of the Lords on the Conservative side has been extremely uncooperative. The crossbenchers, the Liberals, ourselves, and the Conservatives backbenchers are very strong with us. And today they've agreed even more time. And next week we're going to experiment with the app for us to be able to vote as well. But this is going to go on as we know the way this virus is. We could be in this hybrid situation for all sorts of reasons for 12 months. So this is a real, again, win-win situation. The only countries that are doing it really well, as far as I know, are Ireland and the European Parliament. But other countries are now looking at it properly or doing other ways. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, if anyone's got any questions, if you just want to put them in the chat box, um, yeah, it'd be great to hear what you'd like us to talk about um, a bit more um, while people are having a think. Um, I'm just going to, so something I guess that really struck me was that, um, you know, you were a kind of counsellor um, quite a few years ago, if you don't mind me saying. Oh, <laughs> Age um, as I am now, and I was just wondering how, as a young woman going in being a counsellor, I guess being elected as a um, you know a community leader, how did you manage to um, I guess sort of have an element of authority, even though you were female and even though you were younger? And I was wondering what sort of support you got to help. Um, 
sort of have confidence to really articulate the issues that you know the community that you were um, representing sort of were affected by? Um, I had a number of support. My family, of course, gave me support, both my husband and then my parents and my, you know, my extended family. They, they were very supportive and very helpful in explaining issues that I wasn't sure about how we take it forward. Sometimes you always have to ask somebody. I had J Johnny Hutton, uh, who unfortunately has now died, but he was the chair of the local party and treasurer of the post office workers union and somebody called Dorman Long, who became a co-counsellor. And we used to do surgeries every Friday, every other Friday. And one of my co-party uh, co contacts and co counsel we always did them together. We always had somebody with you. So that taught me, don't do meetings without having somebody there, because somebody saved it, promise. We used to do a lot of work going to visit people on Sunday mornings, because that was what you did then. It's so different now. Um, because then there was not what we've got just now. Not everybody had a telephone and, and, and all the issues we have. Um, we just realized, and also the council I was on had a lot of interesting wanting to make change on housing and education. I became um, chairman of, of, of the um, housing development um, committee. I um, was also, which was, the, one of the great groups that I represented on my council seat was Dustman, you know, and so uh, I, I had to work with them quite a lot because they would go on strike very quickly unless things were right. We had to stop that. Also, mm -hmm. in those days, you had the allotments committee alongside trying to improve education, improve housing. You had all these issues as well. And also trying to do um, development um, for better housing, for better shops, because you know, as part of council housing, you had to convince the banks they had to come, had to convince shops to come, otherwise housing was dead and you needed that income for the rates and so on. So it, it was like a village of a village, you know, there was, um, but there was a lot of people wanting to make that change. The Labour Party itself in Brent was not a bad Labour Party. It was, you know, made up of four constituencies uh, the, the constituency I was in was Wilsdon East and then it was Wilsdon West and we had two good MPs we had Laurie Pavitt and um, you had Reg Friesen who was a housing minister at that time and Laurie was a great backbencher did a lot of stuff on disability so uh, you had privilege of having two good MPs who raised the issues if you gave them the information and got you to come to parliament I saw that one of our colleagues just now uh, said he came from Glasgow. I was amazed when I used to go to Parliament how people from Scotland were down every week to put their MPs. If we went into Hassel, our MP about something, it was with great trepidation about once in three months and it was by invitation. But with them, they were down and continually to be down, ensuring getting the best, you know. So um, I was encouraged, I had a lot of good support, I had good people who worked with me. Um, I wasn't alone. I didn't feel alone and I made friends there and those some of those friends are still myself and that's why when I went to the House of Lords uh, my title is Baroness Gaudia of Roundwood named after the, the seat I represent and Brent has had good MPs since Laurie and, and, and Reg died um, and it's a difficult area but it's it's continued to do well but still has problems of poverty and because it's two areas that don't really go together, but go together, you know. But I learned a lot, I, as I say, I helped set up a housing association there, worked with the Trades Council with Jack Dromey and Harriet Harman. That's when I first met them. They were running the Trades Council, involved in Grunwick. So, you know, there was a lot of good people in, you know, there, as it were. I think that's great. And it's, yeah, really important, I guess, to hear that narrative of, um, I guess, and we've caught, I suppose, in young Fabians having good male allies. So, um, and then female allies to go. Who sort of support you, but allow you to sort of develop and, and yeah, I guess, have your own voice as well. I'm going to um, just switch to Craig, who's asked a really interesting question in the chat. I'm just going to unmute you. Craig, can you speak? Yes, I can. Yes. Hello. Hi, Craig. Hello. 
Um, I've, I've, I've put on a kind of long-winded, uh, kind of again addressing the background um, of of the issue. But again, from starting off as a councillor, it might go full circle. Uh, so, so basically, I, I live in an area outside Glasgow, which is known as Red Clydeside, that has the worst rate for gender-based domestic violence, health inequalities, low employment. Where about Glasgow? Clydebank. I know Clyde Bank, yeah. Clyde Bank, yeah, yeah. Um, poor quality of housing and low paid jobs. So basically, t t you know, top top five for, 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 for the worst of everything, basically. Um, so this is an SNP controlled council, uh, which obviously previously was Labour. We need to win again and implement policies that will change and enhance lives. So, how do we therefore engage with disadvantaged women? who have turned SNP voters and return our community to Red, side, Red Clyde side once again. Now, I appreciate you might not have all the answers tonight, but in turn, it's a long, you know, it's a multi-layered uh, issue, but, you know, it's something that that's, we, we need to work on and we need to focus on um, so that uh, women who are experiencing so many inequalities look at um, Labour, Scottish Labour in particular, as, it, as its own brand, uh, and see that they can be trusted. Yes, I mean, I was privileged when working in Scotland, and I lived in Glasgow for for for, for some time, and did work in Glasgow, um, and worked with with the Donald Dewar team of Donald and and John Maxton, and Helen Liddell and Margaret, Pratt, all of that group that you well know, and something desperately went wrong that the trust was broken and Douglas Alexandra worked with who's great on policy and Wendy you know you know that whole gambit of that era and Pat McFan these people were trusted and something went wrong that broke the trust you know or maybe that you won not to break the union and I was asked by Tony to go and work up in, in during that period and I, I did the fundraising behind the scenes to, to, you know, to pay for what ads we needed and other issues, is that we, we, we won that election not to break the union. We set up a Scottish parliament. And I think some of the problems were that some, not enough senior people came from Westminster to the Scottish parliament. And also, I think when we got the parliament and we had Westminster, the party underneath was lost because everybody was either in the parliament, they were running the council, but what I call grassroots, as I see it, were forgotten. And that there was not enough linkage between the party, the grassroots, and those who were holding the power. And when I say power, you, I don't mean power power. I mean, you know, having got, good, got, got jobs in parliament, having to run local authorities, having to the newness of the uh, Scottish Parliament, which was very time consuming, trying to get that up and running. I think we lost out on policies and other issues with the party members. I don't think there were strong enough, there was leaders, but not enough strong people under the leaders. And that's where I think, and policies. And we now have to work, as we've seen in other areas, it has to be bottom up not top down. So got to think about the policies, got to shout out. I mean, the, the, those five issues that you mentioned, I mean, the issue that drives me insane, I just do not understand why somebody goes to a football match and they lose and they go home and they beat their wife up or girlfriend or whatever. I mean, to me, it's, it's just awful. And the whole question of, of um, violence in the home and what damage it does to children and to other people on the periphery of that home is terrible and must be even terrible. And during this time, I found it awful. The whole question of violence um, in the home is, 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 is just appalling. Um, but I think we have to start in Scotland with the, with the party, both with the branches and the constituencies and the other the unions and the Fabians and social society, whatever organizations and there was, is, is, is working out what's the main issues that you think you can win the election on. And you have to win at every level. Do you want to come back on that? Uh, just, um, just for a second. Thank you. That, that's, that's really helpful. And you need to pick the issues then. Pick four or five 
good issues that you can work on, you know, um, including street cleaning, but at the same time, a new school or what we need to be spending on the hospital, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, and, and, and for example, we've seen the whole question where the councils weren't willing to pay equal pay and Glasgow had to, with, with the legislation, Glasgow Union had to take the council to court and that goes back and back. So, you know, we have to make sure that these issues are agreed and tidied up. I think one of, one of the real significant issues for Scotland is, is the constitution and it's the absolute bane of, of life at the moment because it's automatically, it's devolved, it's reserved, it's reserved, it's devolved. Uh, we, we, the SNP mantra is we could do more if we had our own powers to do things, yet when they have the powers and it goes well, they take the credit, they have, but they don't have the powers and it goes wrong, they blame Westminster. And, you know, trying to, that's, that's an absolute pain trying to kind of maneuver around the, the whole thing from a policy perspective and trying to make it as clear as possible to people on on the ground who may not be political you know the reason why the nhs is potentially failing in certain areas is because of x potential issues why you know women's aids are have had their funding slashed by local councils is because of the SAP councils who took that decision um and, 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 and these, these are the areas that we really need to focus on, but it, it doesn't seem to be happening. This is the basic issue, is that people, it's the blame game. But I mean, once somebody's got to ask Nicola Sturgeon at some point, is what are you going to do if you decide to go alone without the Barnett formula? Where yes. are they going to find that money? That is the key, the SNP. How do you replace the Barnett formula? For anybody who doesn't know what we're talking about, is the Barnett formula was agreed many years ago for extra funding for Scotland, which was meant to be temporary, but it's been going on for a lifetime, you know, a serious lifetime. And Scotland cannot survive without the Barnett formula. What I saw in the last few days with Prime Minister Johnson is that the way he's dealing with the lockdown is he's becoming more nationalist because Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are pulling yes. the punches against him. And this is what we don't want because we want yes. as best we can as the United Kingdom. But certainly one of your answers is to the SNP, what are you going to do without the Barnett formula? Yeah. And nobody's had the courage to say to them, I don't mean people like ourselves, but I mean, no government has taken on Nicola Sturgeon on this issue as yet. But of course, we need to point out too, that under Cameron and under May, the austerity programmes they put in place and cut taxes is why the National Health Service, housing, councils are in this state. And it makes it worse because the SNP are just holding on to the money. Yeah, I think one of the other key things, if I may say, is, is the, 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 the language that we use around Scotland in particular is, and I see it, you know, even from our, our new leadership, uh, you know, I think Keir's doing a fantastic job, but there's, there's talk of this government or the UK government, um, it's a Tory government. And, and that, that's the thing that has to come across because when you say the UK government, that's exactly the language that the SNP are using. Absolutely. You have to say it's, it's a UK, it's an English government and it's an SNP government in Scotland. Yeah, so, so, so when we're looking at the, the House of Commons, for example, the, the, the language is it's the UK government that are doing wrong, the UK government are doing bad, uh, and when the SNP print leaflets, they don't mention, well, sometimes they mention the Tories, but they talk about the UK government. Uh, but Labour also talk about the UK government when it should be talking about the Tory government. I think you know, subtle language changes and word changes can have a real impact. It's, it's you know, we in the government, when, when we're, you know, when that's been mentioned at Prime, Prime Minister's questions, we're not actually the government. You know, we, and I think that that's some of the language around that is an issue in terms of what then gets put into policy and pamphlets by the SNP who have got a fantastic terrible for us but they've got a fantastic machine oh the machine is, uh, is absolutely is. fantastic machine and I mean, they absolutely wiped the floor with us uh, time after time and it's only getting stronger uh, and, and and i fear for for, for the, the many women who are left behind um who who, who needs the help who needs the women's yes. aid. um you know as you say you know the boyfriend husband goes to a football match comes home uh not some stupid and they've then got nowhere to go because of the women's days have been closed. Absolutely. And also on other issues, the language, it's all about language. 
you know, it's all about yeah. that. So maybe if you want to have a further, you can get in touch with me through through the Fabians. Fantastic. Nice I appreciate it. You. Thank you for your time. Pleasure. Oh, no. Pleasure. Thanks, um, Craig. So we've got another really interesting question here, which is a slight, um, a slightly based on, I think, something that you discussed. Um, we've got Adam, who, um, I'll bring him to talk now. Um, Adam, um, you mentioned about the disconnect between the top and bottom of the party. Adam, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. So um, thank you very much for the talk so far. It's been um, really interesting, really insightful to hear about all of your experience and, and learn from it. You, you talk about um, the need to make sure that the party is more adequately balanced to be led from the bottom up. Um, and I'm just kind of curious about how you've obviously experienced the party at multiple levels. So how do you imagine that we could re-tip the balance of power back down to local levels and, and the grassroots? Where do you think that change needs to come from? I think that change needs to come from from within the party, you know, because we can't push it. But I think that branch, branches have got to be revived, you know, that that councillors and MPs, that council, it's councillors' job to look after their area they represent, which is the boards or the branches. And from there, they could do stuff around policy and also then bring those policies to the GMC to, to revive the GMCs instead of just being a talking shop. And then to take those forward to party conference or to the regional conferences, you know. But we seem to have a huge gap, I feel, between the age of, of 20 to 50. Do you, do you know in the party, and men and women? Do you feel that? I mean, I feel that there is a huge gap of that age group and the, that age group, especially the 40 year olds, we need those people um, looking at policy, turning up to their MPs, to their councillors and saying, can we work with you? How can we make this change? Because at the moment, the void, I think is very big, that there's more people, members of, of, of um, NGOs or supporting NGOs financially than there are of political parties. And it's not just the Labour Party, it's also the Conservative Party. And the Liberals have people who go in and out with them. You know, so we have to try to get young people in the grassroots and in the trade unions at, a low, at that level, going to branch meetings, moving from branch upwards. It has to, or there has to be a new way of the party engaging people in policy but it's got to be around consulting. And now we have um, Zoom and Teams and other forms of, of Facebook, Twitter. There is all sorts of ways of being able to get to people other than just doing stuff on paper. It's a whole new way. That's, yeah, and that's, I think, what's really exciting, actually. We found, exciting. we found in the Young Fabians that through essentially being forced onto Zoom, we've um, managed to have so much more engagement with people outside of London which is fantastic and you know it feels like we're really um, I guess transforming into more I mean Brighton so I'm not in London but we're transforming into more of a national organisation which is really exciting and um, I'm going to use chair's privilege slightly just to ask you about one of the things that you mentioned in your introduction which was about getting um, more women involved in peace talks um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and why it's so important to have women involved in peace talks why they're not usually there and what impact it can have so let's start at the grassroots about war and terror mm and all that goes with fragile states. And we know that at the end of the day, it is women who suffer. It's women who are looking after their children. It's women's husbands who go. It's women that's left to pick up the pieces, etc. And women in the indexes, there's the Georgetown index and another peace index that shows in these indexes that it is women knowing when things are changing. So when it comes to the grand peace talks, shall we say, there've been the war in X and Y. So what happens is the men come in from outside, you know, the Americans come in, whether it's the Swiss and the Brits or the, you know, there's always these great people come in, so-called NATO. But the people who really matter 
are the local women. Because the men will just say, okay, we'll meet, it's all over, shake hands and go off. They forget that peace is at the end of peace, what's going to happen tomorrow. So what women need is to be sure that there's going to be hospitals are going to be up and running at every level. What about education? What about further education? Because remember, during the war, the safest places are the schools. So they take over the schools and the children get thrown out into some unsafe place. Um, you've, you've got to ensure that there's going to be income coming in. So you've got to bring, make sure business is coming in. You also have to ensure that if, if the education system hasn't got universities there, that there's agreements with other countries so that nearby that students would go on to other countries. And of course, there is some online learning that can be pushed now. But then if there's no Wi-Fi or signals up there that's big enough to take that on, that isn't good enough. And students need to be with other people. So women at the peace table are the local women. They know what's needed. So there's a whole lot of issues around families, around dep deprivation, around violence, um, and, 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 and so on. And that's why women have to be at the peace table. It's the women that bear the brunt of war. They're left looking after the children. Their husbands don't come back. Their wives don't come back. And remember, there are now women who are on the front line of war. It is women who are sexually used as a tool of, of war. Also, young boys are quite often used as a tool of war too, which is terrible. Um, so the whole psychological situation around war is bad. So not only do you need to have men and women peace negotiators, you also have to have the local women at the table and signing off. Now in Northern Ireland and in Colombia, uh, you have women at the peace table and they signed up to the, to, 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 to the peace. Northern Ireland is one of the longest peace agreements that has lasted. It has lasted 30 years. If we don't get Bre Bre Brexit right on the Northern Ireland situation, it could be pretty dodgy over there, as we all know. And I mean, it could be bad, whatever they like to try, people like to say. In Angola, the peace talks were so bad because they didn't have any women. The men shook hands and forgave each other for everything and forgot about all women outside who were raped. You know, Colombia, uh, we had women at the tables. There's five overall countries on peace talks where women have been there. In Syria, uh, the women are still sitting outside hoping to get invited. Britain, uh, and it's in hand Simon, has given an undertaking that they will not be at peace talks without women at the table. And we keep reminding them that every month or so when we have discussions on different issues, we get it into the conversation. Um, and uh, Baroness Ainley and, and uh, Lord Ahmed and Baroness Sugg and others are really good on this issue. And so are people, but we have to keep the government, you know, that if you're going to these meetings, you've got to have it. There are real problems with the Americans because the issue on women in sexual violence and some others at the UN, they refused to vote for it and voted it out with, with, with the Chinese together. So, you know, there are issues, but we have to ensure that women are at the peace table because it's about their home. It's about their children. It's about the aftermath of war. That's really interesting. It's, yeah, it's fascinating. That Very I, basic. It's extremely basic, you know. But I think as well that, I mean, yeah, maybe this is a stereotype, but I feel like quite often, you know, particularly in more patriarchal societies, when women do have those caring roles, then they do tend to be a bit more practical. And it's those practical issues rather than the big kind of macho um, sort of ideas that are actually you know, really important in the process of creating a more um, peaceful society. Um, yes, yeah, so that's fascinating. I'm going to um, switch Where's now. the food coming from too? <laughs> um, I'm going to switch now to Dominic, who's asked a really interesting question, which is a bit um, closer to home, um, which is about, um, well, go ahead, Dominic. Sure, I, I hope you can hear me. Yep. Uh, it's, just a little, it's just a little question about um, sort of your experience in politics and the experience of women in politics. Um, and obviously the position of women in politics uh, at local and national level has changed throughout your career. And I wonder if there were any particular policies which you thought had proved effective or particularly interesting to talk about. Uh, and then more recently, we've also witnessed a chorus of female Labour MPs warning of a resurgence in political misogyny within the Labour Party and outsiders and I wondered if you had any thoughts about how best to tackle that or the reasons for it and how we can understand it 
And then finally, um, I was hoping, uh, well, you can see I'm asking three questions surreptitiously, hoping, right. <laughs> hoping you wouldn't notice. Um, <laughs> I was uh, wondering how the House of Lords compares in terms of the place of women within it to other contexts in which you've worked. So let's take the overall issue about harassment against women politicians at every level, whether you're an NGO, because that's politics, whether you're sitting as a magistrate, that's politics, or in a non-political but political situation, local councillors um, and, and women in power and also MPs. There has been enormous, and peers, but let's take the MPs because it's harder. And these are, let's take that first. There has been an enormous surge, more so than ever before, of misogyny through of what I call them guy people under the bedclothes. And some of them could be women, because women don't always vote for women, remember, and don't respect women. Is that the violence on Twitter, on Facebook, and other social media is disgraceful. I have never come across, in, even in fighting race, racism at different levels, have I come across this misogyny against women and women in power and violence against women. Um, and it's certainly ramped up by the right wing. You know, there's no question about that. And you can see that by their language, although they don't have their real names and, and so on. And their threats, and we saw because of what they did, that, that Joe Cox was murdered by this guy that had got wound up by reading their rubbish. And, the, and other MPs have been really threatened, and some men and some gay men have been threatened and also people of colour. But the, the, the violence against women in politics, I have never known it before. There was in the, at another period where people didn't respect women and they said, well, who's gonna look after the children? Who's gonna iron these shirts? That went out the window, that was just a, but now the violence is bad. And it is up to this, well, the government's gotta call it out. Because I think the conservative women have it just as bad. Um, and it has to be called out, and it has to be dealt with, and it must not stop women wanting to stand in public life. And that's what it's about. In the House of Lords, when I entered, there was a bit of stuff around it, but it came from some Tories, and but it it was bad, but nothing like today. Do you, do you know, nobody stopped you getting on a committee, nobody... If people were difficult, you just dealt with it in a very polite way, and that frightened it. To be polite to them, rather, but it's not like that now. In the House of Lords, we don't really have that problem, I have to say. Uh, what we have had is the um, way people are spoken to, the way people treat people, both as officers. There's been sexual harassment from members to officers and or vice versa. You know, there's been a bit of that. And we all have had to sign up to a code of conduct, including going on a training of respect. And um, that came about by, uh, you saw these two inquiries into the House of Commons and the House of Lords, because there is a problem which you can't change and you can change, but not change, is the way people are employed, the way people are elected, and, and the way people treat officers. So the code of conduct, I think, is making a difference. But every member has to be trained. I went on one of the early trainings. Um, I found it good, could have been a bit stronger, uh, but it started. And I think it wakes people up about how you talk to people, how you say to an officer, you know, they've got a job to do, we've got a job to do. So it's how you change and how you speak to that. There has been some sexual harassment of staff uh, and people who've done that have uh, in the House of Lords had to leave uh, or in one case had to, was suspended for a period. So, you know, there is a, a, a way of dealing with it and the same, I think, in the Commons. But the whole issue of, of how you treat people is being dealt with, that's on the one hand, but the whole violence against women in politics is by the right. You know, there's, I haven't come across it in the Labour Party as such. You know, you get a, you know, people don't always speak to people, but that's, uh, you know, um, but, but, but from the outside, it's really bad. I get rubbish and I just throw it away.
I'm glad to hear it. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That's a very insightful response. Thank you. The House rules also, and the House of Commons have um, numbers for you to ring, um, so that you know the police can give you protection through some of the issues we were working on. The, the period that was worse I've been through was the period during the Brexit negotiation. You know, mm -hmm. during those phases, you saw what it was. Well, you saw on television, it was pretty bad. Some days leaving, leaving to go. You know, and you'd leave as quickly as you could. Because the, the anti brexiteers were really vile people. I don't know where they came from. I mean, some of them had their dogs. The dogs are worse than the people. And you just had to make your way. I avoided the station. I used to make my way down to Great Peter Street and, and move away from them then. But it was vile coming in and out. And I'd never come across, and I've been on many demonstrations and so on. But this was when this was vitriolic for months and months. And it was the same people. And one day this guy said to me, where are you going? I said, I'm going to do my work. I said, when are you going to work today? I just couldn't stop myself, you know. He just said, I'm, you know, he, he just couldn't answer me. But that was the worst. I think the whole Brexit thing has brought a different rule, a different mob rule to the country. I think that's sobering as well because I think that um, you know we have this hope that um, for women in politics it will be a sort of linear process towards um, you know respect and inclusion and yeah it's really saddening to hear that it's um, becoming almost more difficult for female politicians to feel safe in their role and feel like they can you know articulate their opinions and not receive um, kickback in that way um, so yeah I guess it's a slight sort of um, can, I just ask it, can I just say one thing the one yeah. thing that has happened is that MPs have their surgeries now in safer places yeah and that they don't see people without other people with them and that um, there is as I said earlier there is the opportunity to get support which wasn't there before Mm -hmm. um, and there was harassment of this sort before, but people didn't talk about it. Um, yeah. But it is out there and it, 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 it isn't nice, but it mustn't stop people wanting to stand for, for, for whatever level of politics, because that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's to stop people going forward. Definitely. Um, so if um, our attendees carry on sort of typing any questions you've got in the chat, box um, I'm going to ask a little bit about so a lot of your work has been through sort of global platforms so whether that's the EU the UN you know G20 G7 and I was wondering if you can talk a bit more about the value of those organizations um, because you know we're seeing this sort of move towards more right-wing more populist governments um, in quite important countries um, and I was wondering how um, we can continue to sort of um, enable those platforms to create positive change. Those platforms are vital for peace and for positive change and that's why I see the G7 and the G20 which is the G7 countries and the G20 uh, because on their agendas they have access to finance which has insisted that banks are making finance available to women. And that started, that was there on the agenda, but was dealt with under President Obama's uh, presidency when he had the presidency uh, of the G7 and the G3. Next year, Britain has the presidency of the G7. The real problem for the last three years has been that President Trump just disrupts these meetings, doesn't know how to behave. His Sherpas are not trained like anybody else's civil service. They don't have, the Americans don't really have a civil service as we have or the French have or the Germans mm -hmm. and so on. And they're just disruptive. Trump just doesn't understand the value of these institutions. Putting him aside, the value of these institutions for peace, for, for research in science, research in medicine, working together, the aid budgets of these putting money into aid, because we know that if we don't give aid, and it shouldn't be aid and trade, and the government here has been doing too much aid and trade, it should be aid to countries. Because if we don't help there, there are going to be more terrorism, there's going to be more, more death, and there's going to be more disease. And we're going to also have further outbreaks of this terrible 
virus that we're seeing just now. I mean, how can people in the, in, 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 in the refugee camps and in Africa and places like that, I mean, the money, I talked to one of the economists in the World Bank and the money that's got to go to save Africa is enormous, but it's got to be spent properly and administered properly. And this is where these institutions like the UN and these other institutions, the World Health Authority and so on are so important. And it's important that we all continue to fund them, especially in richer countries. Now I know in this situation that we're not going to be doing that well, Britain as a whole, but we still have to continue and make sure that the 0.7% aid budget does not disappear. I mean, it'll be less, and it's an act of parliament to change that, um, but it will be less money, but it is important. I mean, we gave 70 million to the, to, to the world just recently, health organization. We gave 50 million to UNICEF, you know, to work with the other charities on, on, on. That's nothing to what's needed. You know, it's big figures in our minds. To us, it's huge, but we've got to work on these budgets and giving money to the UN and working Although we're separate from Europe, we've got to work with those European organizations. Um, but because it's these it's countries working together, we can't work in silos. And the real problem with nationalism is that they, they don't accept this and they see everything as little islands. Um, and they don't understand why there is refugees. Refugees are brought to by war, by climate change, by all sorts of terrible things that happen. And that's why we, we, we have to stand firm and have to stand up to these countries because also it takes away from human rights. I think it's really interesting as well. I'm really excited to see um, what Lisa Namdi does with her brief because I think she's, she's quite unusual in having a very internationalist outlook but is perceived and is very rooted in her Wigan community. And I think it's really exciting to, I'm really excited to see what she does with that and how she constructs a narrative whereby we can, you know, stand up for communities like hers and still be internationalist in our approach as a party. Well, last night uh, when she spoke at the PLP, um, she spoke as an internationalist. She said she wants to see Labour going back to being an international party and has already got us back being members of PAC you know, which is one of the big international labor organizations, working also with the international labor unions. She's asked um, Ray Collins, who's in the Lords with me, and Ray and I actually having a call tomorrow meeting on the phone tomorrow Zoom meeting to discuss how we can do notes on the institutions because um, she's made Ray responsible for those as part of her team. But she says she wants to see us going back to being an open labor party working in the international field. That's where she sees us, that's where she saw Labour doing well. And, and, and so she's looking and is getting people to work with her. And I do know from a friend of mine who spoke with me today that Keir's office is also looking for a top international expert to work with them. So the Labour Party is moving forward, as it should do, to become with an international agenda and looking at all the issues that matter at every level, including working with NATO and, uh, and, and all the other organizations that we sometimes get forget, forget about and the Commonwealth. Um, and this year is the anniversary of Beijing, uh, which there was going to be many celebrations. Not all the issues of Beijing were taken care of and they're going backwards just now, but I'm hoping that, that Lisa, she will raise these issues again in terms of, and also, uh, uh, and Lisa Dodds um, last week said that she sees women on boards as mandatory part of Labour Party policy, the reporting of the gender pay gap throughout and so on. So all of those issues which were just swept under the table before are now coming back out there. And we've got really good people in the shadow cabinet and they're reaching out to other good people. That's really exciting to hear. Um, Okay, if we don't have any more questions, I'm just going to round it off um, just to ask you, I know this is probably a bit between one, um, but um, I was wondering what your advice is to young people, you know, the young Fabians, um, 
and you know particularly young women at the start of their political journey what sort of key bits of advice would you give so i was lucky enough uh, to have mentored a number of fabians through the mentoring scheme and not everybody necessarily wants to be a member of parliament some people would like to be local councillors want to to be magistrates want to run socialist kind of organizations or to influence organizations to work in NGOs. Um, so I think there's a way for the Labour Party to move through in all these fields. Um, and first of all, you've got to work out what you want to do and ask advice for what you want to do. And also, if you're going to run for Parliament, it's important to go on some of the, a lot of the courses that the Labour Party is running, Progress is running, Fabian Society is running, looking at those things, looking at new policy, trying to form and help policy. Um, yes, working with MPs, both in the constituency and in the party offices, or working with, working with local leaders. Look at Georgina Gould, who's head of, who's running Camden. You know, there is huge work that women can be doing, and men, uh, in local authorities. And in some, a leader of a local authority is as powerful, has more power, than a, member, than a backbench MP. If you look at the power of Labour mayors um, and, and Labour police commissioners, so there's a whole raft of, of interesting work that w women can go for. Also, in the mayor's offices, there's very senior roles. A um, number of my colleagues from the, from the Lords have also been invited to work in these roles. If you look at Sadiq's office, you know, the policing, fire, and so on. So you have to look at the issues, look at issues that you're interested in, and then talk to people and let people know that you want to do this. Okay, brilliant. And um, well, I think we're going to... I remember every door's open, nothing's closed. Um, okay, I think we're going to round it off there. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, I've enjoyed it. Thing. Anybody, any outstanding questions, you'd be in touch with me. We can, we can yeah, chat. Yeah, we'll so my details are on the Young Fabians um, yes. website, or if anyone wants to email us, it's info at youngfabians.org.uk. Hope I've got that right. Um, yeah. So yeah, just drop us a line or um, drop us a message on Twitter or on Facebook, and we'll get back to you. So I'll just stop the recording there. So thank you.